Well, good afternoon, everybody. How many of you already ate? How many of you skipped your meal? Anybody? You skipped a meal. Is that okay? I was going to say there had to be some, some good reason for that. So, all right. Well, this uh, session is on the subject of succession, and uh, it's a topic that uh, is growing in interest because there's so many pastors that are uh, stepping out of the senior pastorate and uh, seeking God's will for uh, the future of their ministry. And so we're delighted to have uh, with us uh, today Brother Folger and his son Peter, and they're going to tell the story some of Cleveland Baptist Church and what God did there. And then uh, Dr. Willette uh, and his pastor, Brother Howell, wasn't able to come, but we still have plenty of questions that he can give us both sides of that equation on as far as how they worked together to see God glorified in that process. So, um, and this, this will be videoed and made available, and I'm sure a lot of people are going to watch it because it's, a, it's just a topic that there's a lot of questions about right now. So, uh, ushers, anyone else that comes in, just seat them and uh, get them comfortable. But we're going to go ahead and get started. So let's pray together. Father, we just want to thank you and praise you for this time that we have to discuss the work of the New Testament church. We know that you love the church and gave yourself for it, and we are to be stewards. And so we pray that you would uh, help us to learn some things in this hour that would cause us to be better stewards, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to thank uh, our panel for being with me today, and we are very appreciative of each of you, and of course, uh, Brother uh, Willette. Uh, I thank God for your friendship and for the privilege of, of serving the Lord with you in many different capacities, a lot of striving together conferences over the years and so forth. And uh, Brother Folger, I, I try to remember where we first met, but I was going to say it was at Brother Willette's. Okay, so my memory is correct on that. Um, and uh, then, of course, uh, Brother Peter Folger is uh, with us today, and uh, we're going to hear the stories of two uh, successful succession plans uh, in local churches that are grateful for the prayer and the thought that went into the process. And as we get started, I'd like to ask uh, Brother Folger Sr. Uh, to tell us just quickly your testimony of where you pastored and for how long, and uh, then uh, Dr. Ouellette will have you do the same. Well, I, uh, I have uh, the unique uh, opportunity to sh share that I know both sides of the story because I followed a long-term pastor in a succession plan. And then, uh, because that model worked so well, we did it again. But um, I grew up in Cleveland Baptist Church uh, from the second Sunday of the church's existence. I uh, came back after uh, I had gone away to college. The church was 20 years old, and then I spent the next uh, 41 years of my life there. And the last uh, 24 years, I was a senior pastor. And before that, uh, 17 years, I worked with the founding pastor. And the last five of that, I was a co-pastor with the idea that as soon as he resigned, immediately we'd have a, uh, the, I'd be the pastor of the church. So 40, how many years? 41. 41 years altogether. So you, you were on the receiving end of the succession plan and then the giving end. or the, uh, That's a pretty, pretty amazing story, really, when you think about it. Dr. Ouellette, obviously, we're all praying for you and for your health. And thank you for your faithfulness in the midst of this trial. And, uh, but tell us a little bit about your time in uh, Bridgeport and uh, the work there. And then uh, when, uh, when you stepped into evangelism and, and uh, Brother Howell became pastor. Uh, I pastored First Baptist Church in Bridgeport for 44 years, starting when I was 22. I observed that most pastors that God used stayed a long time. Ask God, let me do that. Early in our ministry, I met Brother Thompson. Had him preach for us. He had me preach for him. I got to watch the transition there. And it was hugely instructive in what we did at our church. So we took four years altogether from the time I spoke to Brother Howell until the time that I stepped out. So a four-year process. Well, we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Let me start by asking uh, Dr. Willette, as a senior pastor, did you place an emphasis on seeking the right man or on setting a time on the calendar with the Lord and trusting him in the process. So was it a timing issue or was it the right man issue first? Which kind of occurred in your life first? Well, I told the church when I went there that if God let me, I'd stay between 40 and 50 years. But between 62 and 72. 
I got close to the 40 and I started trying to figure it. And I looked at this guy and I looked at that guy and I looked at another guy and they all had problems. <laughs> and God told me two things. He said, number one, you're trying to replace imperfection with perfection. They've had a flawed pastor for 44 years. The next one will be flawed as well. Then he said, you just pastor this church. I'll tell you when and I'll tell you who. And as we got to the time, God made it very clear to me that Brother Howell was to be the man I recommended and that he was ready and it was God's time for me to begin the process. Now, Brother Folger, I, I want to imagine that it was a little different for you in the sense that with your son, you know, I think every father perhaps would dream of a, of a son being in ministry or uh, succeeding you in ministry, but I know you well enough to know that that, that wasn't your grand design. You wanted God's design. So the question is, though, were you seeking a time frame first or the man first? How did that go in your, in your case? Uh, the only way I can explain it is it really was kind of a mirror of what happened to me. I uh, had only been on the staff about five years when I was with Brother Thompson making a call one day. We're sitting in a traffic light, and he looks after, over at me. He says, I've been praying for a while that God had sent me a young man that I could train to be my successor. And he looked at me and said, I think you may be him. Well, you could have knocked me over at that moment because I had no idea that that would even be a, a possibility. And uh, so, you know, from that point, it was another 12 years before the transition took place. And all, all those times, I mean, when we got closer, of course, he started talking to the men. Well, the same thing really kind of happened with Pete and I. I, uh, I just... Pete had been with me about five years, and we were heading down the highway. I don't know if he remembers this or not. We were heading on 480, going to make a call. And I said, you know, Pete, I just believe that God is going to have you be the pastor of this church. But I said, we can't make that happen. God has to make that happen. And I said, we just need to trust the Lord. And I said, it's got to be the people that have that, because if we try to make it happen, it's not going to work. God has to do it. But I knew at that point, and he'll tell the story about something Pastor Thompson said to him as well. So, okay. okay. Now, before we go to that part, I want to reiterate and make sure I understand that you said it was about four years from the time you spoke to Brother Howell uh, that he actually uh, became the pastor. And what was the time frame from when you said that to Pete that, that, that he became the pastor? I'm guessing. So it would have it's about 14, 14 years before it happened. Yeah. Okay. And Peter, since we're on that subject of um, those kinds of conversations, um, I think I know you well enough to know that you were not in a, in a uh, posturing mode. I think you probably went there to help your dad and to grow and to be open to what he had. Um, when your dad told you that, uh, what kind of ran through your mind and how, how, did, how did the Lord begin working in your heart? Well, I remember him saying it on several occasions. In fact, as I was preparing for this, you folks had sent us some questions ahead of time. And, and I actually remember several instances in which we would be in meetings. He and I would be, he'd be, you know, I'd re reporting on this or reporting on that because I was the youth pastor at that time. And it would sort of be just sort of a throw in at the end of the, the conversation, sort of a, you know, again, I, I, I do feel like the Lord's doing something here. And, um, you know, sort of maybe as overwhelmed as he was, you know, when Pastor Thompson talked to him is sort of how I felt. I would, I would immediately, you know, walk away from those meetings and I'd, text my wife and I'd be like, he did it again, you know, he said it again. And she would, oh no, you know, both of us sort of, you know, really, is this, <laughs> is this what's in our future? So um, overwhelmed, scared, um, all of those, you know, all of those thoughts. I can imagine. And, and, and I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Ouellette and, and Dr. Folger this. I, I've read some books on succession and, and this, this type of thing. And one of the statements that I read was that you want when you pass the baton to somebody, you want to still be running. And to what extent did energy and physicality and uh, just the sense of uh, the, the, the nature of ministry affect your thought process with respect to succession? Dr. Ouellette, why don't you go first? Uh, not at all with me. Not at all. Not, not at all with me. If God had told me to pastor five more years, I'd been fine. I just knew it was his time. So it wasn't a, a physical thing as much as a sense that God was bringing you to that time. How about you, Beth Folger? I always thought that, again, I would rather 
pass the church off when I was at the top of my game, then it's starting to decline and they wish that I was out of the way. And so in my mind, I just thought by the time I get into my 60s, my early 60s, it would be in the best interest of the church for me and for the church. Um, Pastor Thompson did that. I just thought that it was a younger pastor coming in and just keeping the pedal on the ground and moving that church forward. So I, I think I could have done it for a while. I have to tell you, though, towards the end of it, I was ready to let it go. I think God just changed my heart. And I thought to myself, I don't want to set in another meeting. I don't want to plan another event. I was just done. So that was kind of my thinking. So. Tell us what you really thought. <laughs> I'm kind of blunt. I'm sorry. <laughs> let, 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 me just, let me just jump in here real quick. Yeah. My, my kids, which would be obviously his grandchildren, will tell you to this day, Papa is a different man now that he's no longer pa- pastoring. He's more fun. He's more, you know, because the weight, the burden, you know, was, was shifted off of him. And then they'll tell you that I'm... I took all of that, and now I'm the mean, nasty guy, I guess. I, don't know. <laughs> I can imagine. So let me ask you that, uh, Peter. As the successor, uh, describe for us the conversations that started with your dad about the potential. So, um, again, it was, it was always at the tail end of, of some type of a meeting, uh, and it would just, we just, it would just tran- transition organically. You know, maybe, you know, because I'm his son, you know, he would finish, you know, saying whatever he needed to say about whatever he wanted to talk to me about. And then we would just, you know, how's the family at home? You know, how's, you know, how's Sandra doing? How's the kids? And how are you doing? And then it normally would, you know, I still, I still believe that this is maybe what the Lord is doing and we just need to be patient and we need to wait on the Lord. And, and, um, and, and so that was sort of, you know, how those, how those conversations that I remember them uh, sort of how they how they came to be. So, uh, succession is is a series of conversations, and first with the Lord, and then with a potential successor. But brother Willette, I know there are other conversations. You have staff, you have deacons, you have long time members, uh, you have maybe some some pastor friends or key people that that were involved in ministry, school relationships, whatever. Can you talk to us about some of the relationship? Uh, conversations that you started to have, um, ones that might have been private, ones that might have been as meetings with groups. How did you prepare the church in those ways? I read a great principle in a book on stewardship years ago called The Principle of Progressive Involvement. And you start with a key person that you know is godly, is going to have the right response. You get him on board. Then you go to the next person. He says, Dr. Brother A., he thought this, what do you think? Then you go to the next person, talking to brothers A and B. So I did that. I talked to Brother Al. I said, I cannot choose my successor. I believe God's going to want me to leave in three to five years. And I think he wants me to recommend you. I told my wife, when he prayed about it for a week and said yes, I began to tell others. I told the best layman in our church, the best staff member in our church. Here's one of the things the Lord did. Lee Edwards is in heaven now, as good a Christian as any church has ever had. Ran uh, at 10,000 employees at General Motors under him. And I said, I think God's going me to gradually move out in the next three to five years. I believe Brother Howell should be a successor. And he said, oh, I love Brother Howell working in the camp. I think he'd be great. I believe in gradual successions. The next layman I talked to was Dr. Ed Martin. You had him work on you. And he kind of paused and said, well, I guess I'll talk to Lee Edwards and see what he thinks about that. I said, you go right ahead. And I did the same thing with staff, Scott Cowling, the hardest working, most productive staff member. And I spoke to him before I spoke to others. So then by the time I announced it publicly, it was no surprise to anyone. Brother Fulcher, who were some of the ones you spoke with? Well, I think our, uh, our story is just a, a tad bit different than that. Um, Pete was serving as our uh, youth pastor at a, uh, at a point and had done that for probably about 12 years or so. And at that point, we really didn't have really a key associate pastor. In other words, you know, the go-to guy, if I was gone, that would carry things. And uh, when I was gone, Pete would do a lot of the preaching unless we had a guest in. So he was carrying that load. And so um, 
my men approached me one day and said, uh, in one of our, our deacons meetings, they said, you know, we really think that, you know, you, we need to have a key associate pastor. We think Pete should be that guy. So they were initializing this concept. And so they, they I said, I think that's a good idea. And that's when we hired Brother Sam to be our, our youth pastor. And Pete moved in that, that role. And he continued in that role. And about five years out before I, I was ready to resign, I, I went to... Um, I met with our deacons and I said, look, I'm, I'm believing in the next five years it's going to be time for me to step out. And immediately I was approached by three of the men and they said, can we talk to Pete about being the next pastor? And so they really initiated it. And as I said, I, I was so happy with that because that was my thought that this is the way it should be. And I thought these are godly men. If they see what I see and they're walking with God, they're going to, they're going to understand. And that's kind of the way it developed for us. So. Yeah, that, that was probably a confirmation, in a sense, for you, and that, that's a blessing to hear that as well. Uh, let me ask you men, uh, and I'm going to come back to you in a second, uh, Brother Peter Folger, but I want to ask you guys on the uh, side of concern that you might have had for the church, just looking out, you know, number one concern, getting the right man. Were there any particular things that you had that you felt you wanted to be made ready? Were there any financial concerns? Was there any staff concerns? Uh, you know, I've heard of situations where maybe the, uh, the, the senior pastor will uh, take care of some if there's a problem on staff or if there's a, a debt that needs to be retired. Or was there any particular thing that you looked out and said, I'd like to have this a little better prepared before uh, we passed the baton. Brother Led, anything like that that you don't want? Yeah, with? I wanted us to be out of debt, to be well-staffed, and have ample money in the bank. I said, the next guy may make a mess, but I don't want it to be because I left him one. Excellent. Yeah. Brother Folger, how about you? Well, we went through a, a time in which we dealt with uh, our debt, and that was probably, uh, we finished that in about 2009. So we were looking at, you know, again, 2019. So about nine years before that, we had already retired all the debt. And I really think our church was really, uh, from that point on, was just building momentum uh, in, in getting ready for the next pastor. But I definitely agree, if there is some problem issue that that pastor, before he hands it off, needs to deal with it as much as possible. I inherited a debt, but I, I had pushed for a building of a building when I was the co-pastor because we needed it. And I told the pastor, I said, I would assume it. And after I got it, I wish I hadn't said that, but it's just so. <laughs> to, to be fair, David left Solomon with some messes. Yeah, that's true. He had to kill Adonijah. Mm -hmm. He had to kill uh, Shimei. Yeah, that's right. He had to kill Joab. And the Bible says, then the kingdom was established yeah. in the hand of Solomon. Yeah. So sometimes it's the will of God for the new guy to come in and show leadership in that way. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Peter, when, when you knew that this was, spiritually speaking, kind of underway, you know, not just your dad mentioning it to you, but now some men talking about it, uh, talk to us about uh, how you tried to honor the Lord in the process, particularly in your relationships with others in the church and with your dad. And not as dad, but as pastor. Talk about how you wanted that role between the two of you uh, to be seen and understood in the years before you became pastor. Well, we were always, I think both of us were always very sensitive to the, to the father-son dynamic. Um, and there is, a, there is a term out there that is kind of bandied about, the idea of legacy churches where, you know, it's just assumed and even to this day, I have a 10-year-old son, and he's, you know, he's a 10-year-old. And people will make jesting comments like, well, one of these days, his name is Toby, when Toby's the pastor, and I'm sitting here going, we're not even anywhere near anything. You know, I mean, he's, he's just a kid, you know. But there is that, there is sometimes that pressure, you know, that, that folks, you know, dwell under. And so we had those initial conversations, and we both, you know, he was very clear with me, I can't do this. I can't. I, and, I, and I don't want to do this. This has to be of the Lord. Um, we, we both believed that the Cleveland Baptist Church was more important and it was bigger than us. Therefore, if the Cleveland Baptist Church didn't want it, we didn't want it. And so, um, and so we just kind of committed the thing to prayer. And much as he was hearing from key men, I would hear from key men. Uh, there's a man that I greatly respect in our church. that has been there since early 1960s. And he would, he would pull me aside and say, now, one of these days when you're the pastor, and he was serious. 
And those were confirmations to me. Like, okay, this is, he's seeing this. And, um, and, then, and then there would be people say stuff like, well, we know. And I'd say, well, you know what? Well, we know. Well, you know, what do you mean? You know, you know what? Well, we, we know one of these days you're going to be our pastor. So those all were, were, were confirmations to me. And that was before there had been any conversation of a transition, of a co-pastor. All of that was happening in that 14-year window that was described earlier between when he started talking and when it actually took place. Um, and so, um, and so that, those, that's, what we were, that's what I was looking for, to know that this is really, the Lord is in this. Um, I don't know if that, answers, if, if that answers your question. No, that's but. helpful. And that leads into the next question, which is for Brother Willett and Brother Folger again, in the sense of how did you begin to treat Brother Howell any differently as the Lord was laying this on your heart? Tell us kind of what he was doing and what did you begin to delegate or share with him in that three to five year process? I met with the deacons and I said, from now on I'm gonna to refer to him as Pastor Howell. He was Pastor JD. He was our youth pastor and then our principal. I said, I would encourage you to do the same. Number two, I would not make any hires that he did not approve of. And number three, I would regularly say, when an issue came up, why don't you check with Pastor Al on that and see what he wants to do. He'll have to live with the consequences longer than I will. Interesting. Brother Folger, how did you, uh, in a way that wasn't pushing Peter per se, but was just giving him more experience or exposure? So um, again, we kind of mirrored what we had done when I stepped into this position in the sense that we three men met with Pete and the three key deacons that were kind of, if you wanted to use the term, would be what would be considered a, a pulpit committee. They spent an afternoon with him and, and then uh, they, uh, they prayed about it and they recommended him to the full, um, full body of our deacons. And we gave them an opportunity to speak to Pete and, and ask questions. And they had a month to pray and then they all came to a conclusion that this would be a good thing. And we presented the church so this is about three years before he became pastor. He became, no, the church voted to make him the co-pastor and the successive pastor, either upon my death or res resignation immediately. So immediately there was this pastor-co-pastor relationship. But in that relationship, there's always still the pastor. So it's kind of like a, a wife. She's, you know, she's got authority, but she's obviously under the leadership of her husband. So that's kind of the way we looked at that. And from that point on, he began to preach every other service. So... If I preach Sunday morning, he preached Sunday night, if, and then I preach Wednesday, and then the next week. How long did that last? About the, three years. About so three. for three years, you shared yeah. the pulpit in that way, and you did similarly, uh, a, a somewhat of a mathematical equation with well, J.D., with Pastor Howell. We, we did it the last two years, and I learned from Brother Thompson, we never told anybody who was preaching when. I said, I don't want you to pick the old guy and make the new guy feel bad. And I sure don't want you to pick the new guy, <laughs> make the old guy feel bad. So you just come to church because it's church. And it was very irregular. Might be him two weeks, me one, and then him a week and me three. But it was just So theirs was, was, sounds pretty balanced. Mm -hmm. And I imagine yours might have even been a little around your schedule. I, I, it was. I made sure it was even, but it wasn't every other week. And so that was uh, for about two years for you and about three years for you. And I think that's one of the key points in our conversation today is that from what I'm hearing, four to five years out, there's an identifying of a person two to three years out. There's a sharing of pulpit responsibility, which is uh, certainly major. I would assume also in that period of time, you would have had guest speakers and maybe sometimes other staff that would preach here and there as well, but predominantly it was Brother Peter or in your case, Brother Howell. So now the next question, it really deals more with the spirit of succession. And I know both of you men uh, very well as, as humble men. And uh, sometimes uh, people hear someone like Brother Willette preach a real strong message. They, they may not know, but uh, he, he is one of the most humble men in the sense of uh, he, he doesn't need to pastor or do certain things to find self-gratification. Find, he finds that in Christ, and, um, and he's been a challenge to me in that area, and I've always appreciated it. But I, I would think for both of you that you'll understand this in the sense that as pastors— 
whether intentionally or not, we can sometimes find our identity in our work. We can enjoy our work and feel important because of our work, just like any other man in any other career. And so I'd like you to talk about uh, this fact of how did you lay aside the ego gratification of and the privileges of the senior pastorate? How did you start, let's say, dying to self? And, uh, and, and I remember one time, Brother Lett, I pulled into your parking lot with you, and at, at his church at that time, you had the senior pastor's parking spot. And I remember you said something to the effect of, um, every time I pull into this parking spot, I, re I remind myself this is not always going to be my parking spot, because I think we've all seen the pastor emeritus model who still has a lot of the trappings or whatever. And I took note of that because you were in that process with Brother JD at the time. And so talk about how you had to, in the internal spiritual walk with God, prepare yourself and lay that down uh, so that you, you could do this in a healthy spiritual manner. Well, the Bible says the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. So I would drive in and say, won't have this parking spot much longer. Uh, there's a bathroom with my office. I'd say, well, won't be using this much longer. And uh, I'll be walking in that door after a little bit. And you mentally prepare yourself. But it's a, it's a good pattern for all of life. When our daughter, Carissa, our older daughter, was about five, the thought of her getting married would move me to tears. So I imagined walking her down the aisle. I imagine what I would say, how I'd feel, what would happen. And by the time the day came, it was great. And it is always your job to prepare yourself mentally, spiritually, financially, emotionally for that which is inevitable. And I think that's one of the key takeaways in this conversation is um, life is about preparing. You know, the first thing we prepare for is eternal life, but we must prepare for seasons of life. And I think a lot of pastors stay too long because they never prepared internally. And uh, they hurt many times their ministry in the process. Brother Folger, again, I know that you told me back at the time, and I, I I'd asked you, how did you know it was time? And you said, I was ready. I knew that someone needed new vision and energy and such. But still, you were laying aside everything that you had been called to do in the sense of senior pastorate. How did you process that internally? I think that there's only one way to say it, and that's the Lord has to do it in you. You have to just understand that it's not my church. If I thought that was my church, then I probably could never give it up. But because it's the Lord's church, and he deserves the best. He doesn't deserve our leftovers. He doesn't deserve less energy and less enthusiasm in the pulpit. He deserves a church that is, is moving forward. And so I think you just, when you internalize it that way, it's, it's easier to say, all right, it's time. My, I've served my purpose here. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I, uh, I, when I resigned, I, I don't have an office there. I, I don't have any responsibilities there. I just, I, I wanted him to have the freedom to, to, to be his own man and to be his own pastor. And I have to tell you, this, the sweetest day, I think, in my life was the day of transition. I mean, the sense that, okay, I'm giving it up, but I'm watching a, a son that I've invested in. That mantle of, uh, has been transferred and it was just a, a, a wonderful day in so many respects now Pete how, how did you um, not not restrain emotion but how did you show deference in, and we're gonna talk about deference later too after you took the work but knowing what was coming and knowing that you would have new ideas and you would change this or that but how did you uh, hold back that even while your dad was laying down what he was going to lay down, before you picked that up, how did you manage the emotion of waiting? Well, he was extremely um, gracious to me. Uh, he gave me, and maybe it's because I was his son. Um, again, I, I, obviously he lived it on the other side where, where he wasn't related to the, to the outgoing uh, pastor. Um, but he gave me so much uh, freedom. Um, you talked about guest preachers and that sort of thing. And I mean, he was allowing me towards the end to schedule, you know, who's going to do the couple's retreat and who, you know, who do you want to bring in for the missions conference as a keynote? I mean, he was giving me so much of that. And I, I don't even remember this, but the transition Sunday was June the 2nd of 2019. 
But you, he was so excited to get out of there. He was out of his office by the first of May, and he was having me, you know, move my stuff down to, you know, down to that office. And so, um, again, I think just the way that he, you know, the way that he was excited for it. And again, it could be because of the relationship. Um, it might have been, it might have been different if it was somebody else. I don't know. You know, it's hard. It's hard for me to, you know, it's hard for me to know you know, to know that. But again, he just, he empowered me in many respects. So you felt more liberty to plan things and to go ahead. Totally. You didn't feel like you're pushing the old guy out. Not at all. In fact, the last six months of him being the pastor, he, you know, he had, he had told me ahead of time, I'm hardly going to be around. And he, I think he was, you know, again, just trying to help the church to make that transition before we even got there. And so, and even, even, so the, the preceding two and a half years or so in which we were preaching, I was, I was creating the preaching calendar, you know, and I would check with him, okay, what's your schedule? Well, I'm going to be, you know, here this week. And so, okay, well then I'll just preach all of those, you know, all of those days, you know, have you scheduled anybody? I've scheduled some people. So again, I mean, I, I felt really empowered, you know, by him. And there was, again, just not a sense. I've, I've often likened it to this. Um, I, I think to myself that, and one of the reasons maybe why it doesn't happen more is because I, I have to think, you know, for these two men, it, it almost is like lying on your deathbed. And it's almost like taking the hand of your wife and putting it in the hand of another man before you've even died. Uh, I'm, I'm checking out of here, and here's your I'm here's not going to do that. <laughs> I heard, um, I, I heard, I was, I was mentioning that to somebody earlier today, and they, and they said the name of another pastor who most of you probably know, I, I won't use it, but he said, as he was going through that transition, every time the man that was going to take it stood and preached, it was, in essence, to him, it felt like he was watching his wife dance with another man. And, and so I, I just have to think that, you know, that it just requires so much humility. I think that might be why it just doesn't happen as often, is, is really what, what's being touched on here, is, is just how hard it is to let go of that. Well, I, I do think it's hard, and I think what I sense with your dad and Dr. Willett is that the Holy Spirit had been preparing them so that when the time came, it wasn't that they were all joyous about it particularly, but they were just ready to do what God told them to do, which again is the opposite of so many pastors who for financial reasons, ego reasons, lack of preparation, whatever, holding on and holding on and holding on. And, uh, and, and I think you were the beneficiary of, of God's dealing there. On the subject of leadership in the church, deacons meetings, that type of thing. You both have said that you had your successors preaching a couple years out. When did you bring them into key leadership meetings like that? Brother Willette? I know you don't have a lot of deacons meetings. Just fake it. Uh, we have one deacons meeting a year. It lasts about seven minutes. We did he get to come to one of those? Uh, what, we, what we did is this. When he became pastor, he had some more meetings with the deacons, establishing things, and giving them his expectations. And he asked me about it. And I said, Doc, that's great, but say this to them. Say, thank you for coming, guys. We will not always meet this often. Otherwise, they'll get used to it and they'll expect it. So that was not an issue for us. Uh, we had one staff meeting a week with the pastoral staff, and Brother Al was at that, and there were times I had him lead that. And you would have had him lead that Half the times the last year or so, or? A handful of times. Okay. Probably a handful of times. handful of times. But Fulcher, how about you? Just, just uh, passing so over those reins. When uh, Pastor, uh, when we got, uh, when Pete became the co-pastor, immediately he started coming to the deacons meetings, and he said into all of those. And I would sometimes give him an area that I wanted to speak to the men about. And I, I suppose, I, I can't, I, a little foggy right now, rather, uh, whether he ran a, uh, probably ran a, at least one or two of those meetings without me even being present before he took completely, the transition took place. But uh, again, it's just, uh, you know, I think, you know, he's talked about me wanting to get out of there, you know, but I think part of it was because I was going to something. Right. I think sometimes if you don't have anything to go to. And, and let's go ahead and talk about that because I was going to ask about that. How important is it that a, the outgoing pastor has a concept and a vision for what he's going to? Well, from my perspective, I, I didn't want to be the guy who, okay, I'm no longer the pastor, but I'm going to sit there and I'm going to be sulking every service, you know, 
I want to be his biggest cheerleader. And uh, he and his mother, I think, between me and his mother, I don't know if there's anybody that's more in his corner than we are. And it's just been a joy for us to watch him even further develop. And our, our people are just elated in what has happened. But I do think you have to have something to go to. I, I, don't, want to, I, I don't want to be in the way. Um, you know, I, I, I'll show up, I'll go soul winning, and I'll, I'll do those type of things. And, and uh, you know, if I see something needs to be done, I'll do it. But I, I, or if I see something that I think should be addressed, I don't go to him about it. I, I'll go to an associate and say, hey, you may want to talk to the pastor about this, but don't tell him I told you. <laughs> but, but it's just a, a, some little thing that obviously, or you guys just take care of that. I'll, I'll just say that. But I don't want to be that guy. And you, you became involved in Spiritual Leadership Asia, yes, and, and that's given you time away and yes, time sir. at home. Yes, and sir. Dr. Ouellette already had a healthy speaking yes calendar and you've really just gone into those meetings but let's go ahead and take a minute as brother Folger was saying when he's at home uh, he's a cheerleader for his pastor talk to us about what do you try to do when you're at home to help uh, your pastor my pastor is very gracious he allows me to do weddings funerals and counsel I told our people I'll love you I'll talk to you I'll help you but the minute you criticize my pastor I'm hanging up the phone, and I'll give you a thousand dollars if you can find anybody who's heard me say one critical word of my pastor. Our business meetings last about seven minutes, and we have one a year. There are usually zero questions. Brother Howell's first meeting, I happened to be there, and there were several questions, and I, from my seat, out loud said, "Oh, come on, this is crazy." Because I thought they're asking too many questions. And the next year, there were no questions. <laughs> Brother Howell has done a great job of showing deference to you. And I know uh, he's told me that you told them not to call him, not to call you their pastor. And he came right back and said, it won't bother me at all if you call him pastor. And I've just sensed a common... Uh, spirit of, of uh, a lack of insecurity, we'll put it that way. Peter, how have you admonished the people to respond or not respond to your dad in that? In that, how how have you handled that? I am thrilled when they when they want him to you know to do things, um, you know whether it be a funeral. In fact, a lot of times, uh, not a lot of times, I, but you know our church is sixty five years old, and I I had counted a couple of months ago, and I mean in the in the last, you know, four years, I've done, you know, 40, 50 funerals. And that's just in the church. That doesn't include, you know, funerals and funeral homes and that sort of thing. And so sometimes, you know, if a funeral will come up, a death will come up. And, you know, depending on the circumstances, I, I may say, listen, I'm not going to be in town for that. Um, but I, I guarantee you my dad would love to, you know, would love to participate in that. Is that something that you would be interested in? And so I'm, you know, I'm always, um, you know, happily, you know, uh, encouraging them. Um, if, if it's counsel, if he's meeting with somebody on the property, I think that's great because I, I, I can trust him. I know he's going to give good counsel and I know we're on the same page. And so uh, we, we have him, into, he'll preach at least once a year um, for us. Normally the first Sunday of the, of the year I have him preach. Um, and uh, he's been our keynote speaker for our missions conference. Um, you know, he'll preach, you know, in our, in our Christian school chapel or in our Bible Institute chapel, um, you know, and, and uh, other times, you know, we're, we're happy to use him and, and always glad when he's, you know, when he's in town. It's just an encouraging presence. So, so it's, it's fine when he's gone three months at a time and it's great when he's home Absolutely. doing stuff. And, and I think that's how it should be. And it's a wonderful model. Yes, sir. Um, if I write a letter to a member of our church, a thank you note, I make sure my pastor gets a copy. If somebody calls and asks me for counsel, I call him, tell him what they asked me, and tell him what I told them. I never leave him out of the loop. I think that two-way loyalty is what we're talking about from the uh, pastor to the, to the incoming pastor and, and vice versa. And uh, I, I've seen at times when a, a pastor can get frustrated because things change more than he wants to. And I think in those cases, it's just best that he just lets those change go. I mean, that, that type of decision making ended when the church had their vote and so forth. I'm just curious, both of you had your successors with you for you know, several years. Um, so did you find it necessary, though, to introduce them to any 
community stakeholders or key banking relationships, CPAs, attorneys? Were there any specific introductions that you made uh, in order to help with that transition, or did the guys already kind of know all of the professional relationships? Anything like that come to your mind, Brother Ouellette? Well, I had built really good relationships over the years, but in my last years, as I was busier and traveling more, and people died or got voted out, I lost some of them. I did introduce Brother Al to some key people, but he did a fabulous job of reestablishing those relationships with all the community leaders and was voted the Citizen of the Year for Bridgeport two years after he became pastor. Excellent, excellent. Uh, how, about, how about you, man? Did, did you already have a lot of those? Or, Brother Folger, were there a couple people you wanted to well, make a personal introduction to? Our church is called Cleveland Baptist Church, but it's not technically in the city of Cleveland. So Cleveland sets on the lake, and they have these belts of suburbs. So we're in an inner-tier suburb. It's a small community of about 11,000 residents, six square miles. And... Uh, Fortunately, our business administrator of our church was the council president, city council president of our, our community. And so the mayor was very connected with us through uh, his connection. So they already knew things were going on at our church. But as far as uh, any business leaders, they, they, they were aware uh, because they would come in and, you know, they were meeting with our, our staff and things like that. They knew that the transition was taking place. The, um, the year that you stepped out, I got a phone call from a pastor by the name of Gary Click. And uh, Gary's a pastor in Fremont, Ohio, and um, and he was he had been asked by the governor of Ohio, Mike DeWine, to form a um, evangelical advisory council. And he he is an independent Baptist pastor. He said, "I'd like to get as many independent Baptists as I can on this." And I think he had called you first, and I think you had told him, "Hey, I'm stepping out, but let me encourage you." So I wasn't even pastor yet, and I was sitting on that council, meeting with the governor, you know, four times a year, still serve, you know, in that, in that capacity. So. And I think those are important relationships for the new pastor, and that's why that's a great thing to know. But the other area, we, we said there's a lot of conversations. There's conversations with key men, there's conversations with deacons, conversations maybe with Sunday school teachers, committees, whatever. Maybe the most key conversations are going to be with family. And I think uh, once we get over the hurdle as a pastor, which uh, God brought you through that and, and showed you the time, uh, you have to lead your family along because like us, uh, our wives and children have a lot of, of vested ministry in the local New Testament church. So I'd like you men to tell how you converse with your wife to prepare her for uh, the role change that God brought into your life, Brother Willette, if you'd go first. Well, I told my wife as soon as I'd spoken to Brother Al, it was a little harder for her because her mom was living with us, and she was very ill. Chrissy couldn't get out much. So I had an easier time transitioning than Chrissy because she wasn't there for some of that. But she got to be there at the end. She did fabulous with it. Uh, the owls at us over. Uh, we played games the last Sunday. I gave gifts to Brother Owl. He gave gifts to me. Neither of us knew what the other was doing. And my wife had some gifts for him. And they were they were funny gifts. They were uh, gifts that were reminiscent of experiences that we had. And she did a fabulous job of that. How about you with Denise or, or the extended family? Did you have times of conversation? I think... Uh Pete's wife is, uh, you know, she's very loyal in so many respects. And, and while she was excited about her husband, she wasn't excited about me leaving as the pastor. And perhaps for all of our family members, maybe it was more difficult for her because she doesn't like change. Um, my wife's not given to change either, but she understood that, you know, because God is working in the life of our son, this is a good thing for us to, to, to be in that, that situation. And so there was no struggles whatsoever with any of our family members other than just we're not ex excited about change in, in general. So, yeah. That's, that's great to hear. And it sounds like the conversations were, they were seeing God's timing in it as well. Um, I would like to ask uh, Brother Ouellette, uh, since Brother Hal's not able to be here, what are some ways that he has in, encouraged uh, your relationship, um, that he has encouraged you, um, and then I'd like Brother Peter to say the same thing about what are some ways you've tried to encourage the church. You've touched on it already, like if they want a funeral or wedding, but anything else that maybe would help some of the younger men coming into a role, uh, in other words, so as not to appear to be insecure by, you know, 
taking the former, you know, former administration apart or something. How I know that this has been handled really well on your end. Tell us about that. Uh, brother, uh, let's me have an office. Let's me use the secretaries. He has me preach there at least twice a year, sometimes many more times than that. He's always very gracious and very kind. He said to me, if you ever see me doing anything you think is dumb, please tell me. I said, I probably won't. You'll have to ask. And so he asks on key things. Um, he's very supportive and very positive. Here's what the Lord did. Neither of us know what the other would do. My last Sunday, I asked for 30 minutes in the last service. I gave a charge to the church and a charge to the new pastor. I said, now from now on, I am Brother Willette. This is Pastor Al. I hereby resign as pastor of First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. I introduce you to our pastor, J.D. Al. They applauded. He came up and he said, nah, you can still call him pastor. He'll always be pastor to me. And if I'm there, he'll say, pastor is with us tonight. He's totally kind and gracious. Gives me a generous check every month. And he could not have been more kind to me in all of those ways. Just to hear Brother Willette say that Brother Howell uh, said he'll always be pastor to me makes me respect Brother Howell more uh, because of his uh, desire for a relationship with a pastor, even though he is the pastor. And I think that's something that every uh, younger pastor can learn from in that sense. And, uh, and then uh, Brother Folger, with respect to uh, or Brother Peter Folger, rather, with respect to uh, helping your folks know how to respond to your dad relationally. Any other thoughts that you can share for the younger pastors? Along the same lines of Brother Howell and Brother Ouellette, um so I, I followed, I didn't follow directly, but my grandfather was the youth pastor at Cleveland Baptist Church for 20 years. And he was sort of a larger-than-life figure in that role, and he was known as Mr. Folger. And so when I became the youth pastor, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't hear the idea of Mr. Folger because that was him. And so I would always just tell people, call me Brother Pete, call me Brother Pete. And, uh, and so when I became pastor, most of our people do, do not call me Pastor Folger. Um, in fact, I don't know anybody that calls me that. They all call me Pastor Pete or just pastor or preacher. Um, and and, and, I t and I, I'll even tell people, Pastor Folger's him. You know, because that's, I mean, that's what he was for 24 years. And um, he, uh, this year, September the 3rd, Labor Day weekend, was a, uh, on a Sunday. And uh, I was baptizing that night, and I was in a hurry to get back out because I wanted to recognize the fact that it was September the 3rd of 95, 28 years ago, that my dad was installed as the second pastor of our church. And um, I don't even think he, he'd even, he, would, he wasn't even aware of it. He wasn't even thinking along those lines. And I, and I had him come and dismiss in prayer and... And uh, so little things like that. We gave him the title Pastor Emeritus. Um, as far as, as gifts to give to him, again, we were just very sensitive about the father-son role. Yeah. And so we allowed pretty much the deacons to, to kind of set the parameters on that. And the business manager, Brother Ron, who now serves as the mayor of our, of our city, um, they, they kind of, and I, I approved it, but I didn't, I didn't lead in that because I just didn't want it to look like I'm showering my dad with all of these gifts, you know, on his way out. Yeah, and that, that, that's reasonable and a little bit different, and, and yet I'm sure the deacons were, were fine there as well. So uh, it's been said that if you plan succession well, you might lose your job early, but if you plan too late, you might lose the church. Could you comment on that, Brother Blatt, Brother Folger? Well, I think there's a danger of leaving too soon or staying too long. You have to be guided by the Spirit of God. This is an analogy, but I suppose that the most dangerous moment in a relay race is the handing off of the baton, and you have to know when to do it. Yeah. And I think that same thing is true for the church. There's a moment to do it, a time to do it. Again, too soon, and you lose it too, too late, and it's too late. <laughs> and maybe touching just a little on an earlier panel we did, which was just another wonderful panel like this one. But uh, Peter, if you could maybe touch upon this, you've had a new vision. Obviously, you have some of the same events, missions, conference, revival, whatever. Um, but as you have delved into maybe uh, some new relationships or new methodologies, uh, to what extent have you gone to your dad as, as the former pastor, not as your dad, and just said, hey, I'm, I'm going to try this or do this? 
And, uh, and to what extent do you seek some of his input or counsel, or do you just want him to have a heads up because of your respect for him? I feel like the, I think, feel like the thing that I bring to him the most is situations involving you know, people that I just don't necessarily know what to do. You know, I'll pull him in my office and I'll say, hey, this was brought to me, and I, have, I don't know where to begin. And a lot of times, because he pastored those same people, he can add, he can add some perspective to that. Um, I don't know that I, I really bring you in a whole lot on the changes that we're making, uh, other than, you know, it, the decision's already been made, and I probably will say, hey, we're going to do this. And, you know, he, he does a raised eyebrow thing, you know, in which I know, like, okay, he's not so sure. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, but, but I, again, I think that goes back to the freedom that he gave me and the liberty he gave me even before I became pastor. Um, but, yeah, I mean, a big, big things, you know, when COVID hit, you know, I, I was, you know, hey, what would, you, what would you do? And he was so glad that he wasn't pastoring at that point in time. So glad. You know, so. Yeah. I, I, I want to just interject, and I, I don't want to get ahead, and I don't know how much longer we have here, but, you know, when that first unfolded, I'd only been pastor for nine months. And um, what at that point in time seemed like the end of the world, I am convinced today was something that sped up the marriage process between me and the people. Um, I had been there for, on staff for 19 years, almost 19 years when I became pastor. But there, you, you have to know there were some people looking at me like, can he, can he handle this? Can he do it? Like, we, we, we believe in him, but we also, we also, you know, we watched him grow up. And, um, and I really, I'm convinced of this, that that COVID time, as they watched us make what we felt like were the, you know, sound decisions, and none of those decisions were made alone. We had a team of folks and again, I was including him in, in some of those things. Um, but as they watched, as the church actually emerged, I believe even stronger uh, through COVID, because we, we um, you know, as, as churches were still closed and doing some of the crazy things, we were soldiering on. And uh, people, we picked up people who said, I, I got to be in a church where things are normal. I got to be in a church where we're singing hymns and we're, you know, and, and so our church, I believe it grew um, substantially during that period of time. And I'm, I'm convinced now that what seemed like the end of the world was actually a gift to me uh, as, the, as the new pastor in, in speeding up the process of them being able to feel like they could trust in me and know that I could lead them through, you know, tumultuous times. Now, I can see that and uh, thank the Lord for the way he used it in your life and I think in Brother J.D.'s life too. And I really believe that First Baptist Church of Bridgeport and Cleveland Baptist Church have serviced us well in giving an example of succession uh, with two godly senior pastors who really didn't want to be too early or too late, really laid down their own will to seek God's will, and uh, two younger men who weren't uh, seeking it for fleshly reasons, who have been deferential to uh, their pastors and who are now leading the churches on to new victories and to new life. And that's, that's the goal that we have in this conversation. And I want to thank you guys for taking this hour with me. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. And uh, we'll be praying for you. And I know that Brother Folger and Brother Willett are glad to answer some questions afterwards. If you have any further questions, 